Here's an example calculation showing the effect of conductor length and inductance. The typical wire might have an inductance of approximately 0.2 microhenries per foot. Let's look at a lightning waveform that has a rate of rise of current of 10,000 amps per microsecond. The resulting calculation shows that you can have several thousand volts per foot of conductor length. Now consider how many feet of conductor length might be used in some of your applications to real realize that you could exceed the insulation strength of a coating or an insulator or other insulation system and create an arc even with a protection system installed. And the reason is because the inductance is so high for the conductor length that you've installed. So you want to have short conductor length. This would be an example of an installation across an insulated flange that would use best practices. There is a vertically oriented protection product. It's bolted to the right hand side of the flange. and You see a black conductor coming out to a bracket that's attached to the other side of the flange and the total length is quite small. And so this would represent pretty tight coupling resulting in very good over voltage protection. Here's a different protective product. It's been attached across the flange using bus bars. And plated copper bus bars are going to have a much lower inductance than any cable system, and then that will result in a lower voltage across the flange, even better than in the first example. Products and uh, components are tested for their lightning capability. And the typical values are to use an 8x20 microsecond waveform or 4x10 to a reasonably high peak value of 75 to 100 Ka. Here's a typical power laboratory layout, specifically a lightning lab layout, where this scary looking arrangement is basically a whole collection of capacitors that get charged up they go through some wave shaping elements and they get applied. It's very hard to see in this photo, but they get connected to the device under test where they flash over an arc. The product is connected to ground and the current will flow through the product to the grounding system. The, this kind of apparatus can produce quite high levels of lightning current. So much so that you have signs like these on the doors. The key factor in lightning protection is to limit conductor length as short as possible to limit the resulting overvoltage. Bus bars are going to provide the best overvoltage limitation because they have lower inductance. It'll produce lower voltage than with a flexible conductor system. If you do use conductors, you want to limit the length, and diameter isn't that big of a factor. You just want to have an appropriate ampacity for your system, and that's where diameter comes in. But an increased diameter doesn't greatly help the inductance problem. Rather, that comes from length limitation. Step and touch voltage concerns around a pipeline are generally handled using grounding mats. And what this does is equalize the voltage across the surface of the earth near those structures so that if you were close enough to contact the pipe, you would be over a mat that would limit that voltage, or if there was a voltage gradient in the earth, it would limit that gradient by standing over the mat. If you can bring the voltage of the pipe and the voltage of the local earth near each other, we would say that you've provided protection for a worker. This isn't going to be a really fantastic low resistance AC mitigation ground. This kind of a mat is sitting in gravel, usually. It's high resistivity fill on purpose to further limit the person away from the voltages that would be seen on the mat. But that means it's not going to be a very low resistance ground. It doesn't need to be. Its main purpose here is step and touch voltage protection, not actual voltage reduction relative to earth. We just need to keep the pipe and the local earth relative to each other to a limited voltage to protect workers. When it comes to grounding mat design, 
a grid type grounding mat is going to have the lowest resulting step and touch voltage. Basically out to a distance that anyone could reach and still touch a pipe, basically considered to be about four feet, you'd want to have grounding mats installed around those piping segments at a, say, a valve site or in, within a station. So it doesn't need to cover everything within a fence, but it does need to be within the region where anyone could reach the pipe and contact it. And don't forget our principle about inductance. Connecting the mat to the pipe must be done with short conductors, otherwise we're going to raise the touch voltage that a person would be exposed to. The step voltage may not change at all, but the touch voltage would be unnecessarily increased. The use of grounding mats for step and touch voltage protection is generally done at test stations in a utility right-of-way. Even with dead front test station construction, there still is a step voltage that exists in the earth that one can't avoid. One would want to apply that within a four-foot distance away. Additionally, of course, if it's not a dead front test station construction, one could contact the uh, attachment points that do reach the pipe and one could be exposed to that kind of touch voltage too. One practice that is beneficial is to decouple the pipe from the mat so that there is not a CP effect uh, by the placement of the mat near the pipe. Decoupling means that there is not a CP effect. There's been DC isolation between the mat and the pipe and we'll touch on that in a moment. Here would be an example of a gradient control mat system that's been installed. It is not yet covered with high resistivity fill over the top of it, but it has been assembled in place and follows the path of the pipeline through the station. You also can see in this diagram the black cylindrical looking device on one of those pipelines that has wires coming from it. That is the decoupling device that bonds the matting to the pipe. So through that device, the pipe and the mat have continuity from an AC standpoint, but normally there's DC isolation between the two so that there's not a CP effect on the pipe. As mentioned before, the best performance in a grounding mat system will come from a mat that has a grid style. As compared to a mat that is made up of a single wire, doesn't matter if it's in a spiral shape or a zigzag or any other, a single conductor system has a very long length. Back to our topic before, long lengths have high inductance, and for a lightning event, a high inductance produces really high voltages. The difference between these two mat designs could be as much as 1,000 to 1. There's a very large voltage difference and performance difference between those two designs. And the difference is all because of the inductance. Any mat system, though, should be attached to the pipe with a short bond. Otherwise, we're again violating our principle of having low inductance, low, short paths. Here's an example of the grounding mat designs. On the left, any single conductor system can only have current flow down that conductor path, and that's an ever-increasing length from the point of attachment to the pipe coming out of the ground. If it's a gridded design, current will flow in all directions away from the pipe. And as current flows away, there's more and more interconnected paths. There's lower and lower inductance in that kind of a system. The voltage drops off with increasing distance from the pipe in the case of a gridded mat. So it gives the best performance and lowest voltage at the edge of the mat. With a spiral mat or any type of single wire, it's going to have a very high voltage at the edge of the mat, which is not desirable. Let's turn to the topic of AC induction. This is an effect that occurs where pipelines and power lines are generally in parallel or basically near each other, and there's an effect from the current flow on the power line. Current flow produces a magnetic field surrounding that current flow, and that interacts with a steel pipe. That's going to raise the voltage on a coated system. If the pipeline were bare, you wouldn't have this effect. But these ever-increasing insulation systems for pipes has resulted in ever-increasing AC induction as well. 
Here's the relationship between induction and other factors. If the soil resistivity were to increase, the induction on that pipe, all things equal, would also increase. The soil, along with the coating, makes the pipe look more isolated from Earth, and the induction can increase. It's like a better insulation system. If the coating resistance were to increase, the same result happens. The induction, all things equal, would also increase. Better coatings mean this is more of a problem. As the load current on the power line increases, so does the magnetic coupling, and the induction will increase on the pipe. An interesting factor is, with distance from the tower, if, that, if the distance from the tower were to increase, the induction would decrease. This is from our earlier, earlier discussion where further distances from the tower produce a lower induction and also lower arc risks as well. However, if there is ever a change in distance from the pipeline to the power line, any change at all will result in an increased induction effect at that change. This could come from the pipeline or the power line veering away from each other, or if the power lines were transposed in their orientation relative to the pipe, which occurs on transmission systems, then that would also produce a spike at that area. The way that AC mitigation gets accomplished is by establishing a low resistance connection between the pipe and a grounding system. This is going to collapse the induced AC and there will be AC current flowing one could measure and find that this induced AC voltage is now very low. If one was to decouple, again using these products that we'll talk about called decouplers, there will be no effect upon the CP. So this is a DC blocking device but with somehow mitigating this AC. We'll talk about their characteristics. Such a system would have to be rated for the steady state conditions but it would also have to be rated for the fault conditions. So what is a decoupler? That is this DC blocking device that can also simultaneously conduct AC. It will have that characteristic of blocking DC up to a threshold, a voltage that's usually several volts, and beyond that voltage, that would be considered abnormal, it will then turn on and conduct to provide over voltage protection for lightning, fault current, or any other abnormal condition. Usually these days, this device is a solid state device. It is generally fail safe, and what that means is if exposed to current beyond the ratings of the device, the device will always fail as a short. And that's something that can be tested for in a power lab to make sure that excessive current beyond the rating will produce the desired result of failing shorted. It wouldn't be desirable to have the product fail open because you'd have no further over voltage protection of any kind in the future. Also, use of this kind of a product is done in a hazardous location very commonly, and so such products really need to have certifications for use in hazardous locations.